Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Okay, so um, hello everybody. Welcome to the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica. And tonight we're going to speak about the use of the elemental diet for IBS SIBO and inflammatory bowel disease with Dr. Kathleen O'Neill. I'm Dr. Ben White, and I'll be making some introductory remarks before introducing our sponsor, Integrative Therapeutics, um, and then I'll introduce the speaker. I encourage each of you to participate and uh, ask questions by typing your question in the chat box, and then I'll either call on you or ask Dr. O'Neill Smith your question when it's appropriate. Thanks for joining the Functional Medicine Discussion Group monthly meeting, and I hope you consider attending some of our future events and I look forward to meeting in person once the Santa Monica Library goes back to their normal hours. Our next meeting is October 27th, and it will be on males and females have different immune systems and why it matters with Dr. Felice Gersh. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We've had her speak several times. Um, I haven't figured out November 17th. Um, and then if you're not aware, we have a closed Facebook page, the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica, that you should join so we can continue the conversation when this evening is over. Um, if anybody's listening to this recording afterwards, uh, I just want to mention that this group is just for practitioners. Um, so I'm recording the event. I'll include it in my weekly Rational Wellness podcast, which you can subscribe to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. If you listen to the podcast, Rational Wellness, please give me a ratings and review on Apple's pod, App, Apple Podcasts. I'm pleased that the sponsor for this evening is Integrative Therapeutics, uh, and we have Steve Schneider on the line to tell us a little bit about a few of their products. Steve? Um, hello. Yeah, um, I don't want to take too much time. Dr. O'Neill Smith is going to do most of the stuff for me tonight, but um, there's some pretty exciting new changes to the elemental diet dextrose free version that I want to just let people know about. Um, if we have two, there's the original formula that uses dextrose as the carbohydrate source. And then the second launch was de uh, the dextrose free formula that used a maltodextrin. Um, we had a few, not a whole lot, but a few, some feedback on the maltodextrin dextrose-free version that, um, that we kind of took into account and we made some changes to. Um, we've, we've changed the actual source of the, the maltodextrin. So we were using a different raw material supplier. Um, Dr. Weitz was asking me, does, you know, a different source, does that mean Vietnam instead of China or... <laughs> corn instead of malt or whatever. And um, none of that. It just means we're using a different raw material supplier. Uh, we feel like they make a higher quality product. Um, and we feel like it's going to lead to, a, and, and so far it's bearing out that it leads to a more well-tolerated formula and, um, and a better patient experience. And while we were doing that, we also we reduced the total carbohydrates from 23 grams to 15 grams per scoop. And each scoop is 150 calories. Um, we increased the protein content from seven and a half grams to 10 grams per scoop. And we increased the fat content from four grams to six grams per scoop. Um, none of this has changed the, the hypoallergenicity, if that's a word of the formula. Um, it's a little more dense. The scoops are going to be a little bit smaller um, and you're not, it's not going to be anywhere near as sweet. Um, it's actually a little more citrusy. Some people have said tart, but the higher amino acid content is, is where you get that citrus flavor from. Um, and we think so far people who've had both are like, don't send me that old stuff anymore. <laughs> so, 
So that's a pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good feedback on that. So we have sample packets of it. Um, so anybody who's interested in trying it, just to see what it, what you know, the patients are in for, um, we're happy to provide those. We also have samples of the the original formula and and lots of resources to go with it for not just the SIBO protocols, but everything else. So um, yeah, that's it on that. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay, Steve. thanks, Steve. Um, Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith is a magna cum laude, graduated the Boston University School of Medicine. She did a fellowship in anti-aging and regenerative medicine, and she has an extensive background in nutrition, applied physiology, functional medicine, and sports medicine. And she's been on the faculty at Tufts University School of Medicine and Boston University School of Medicine. For decades, she competed as a member and later as coach of the U.S. Women's National Rowing Team. Kathleen, you have the floor. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Steve, I wonder why you don't just get rid of the old version. That's the question of the elemental diet. Um, but you can answer that maybe later. So let me share my screen. Thank you all for having me. Uh, it's it's early for y'all. It's I don't even know if the sun is set, but we have been long set in Boston. <laughs> and, uh, and, and But it, I wish I were there with you. Sadly, I'm not. But at any rate, let's start. Can you see my screen? Can you see the slides? Yep. Okay. So um, SIBO, I think it's very enigmatic. I think SIBO is kind of part and parcel of many things. And I think there's a, such an interconnectedness in the body and we need to be thinking about that and thinking bigger than SIBO. For me, SIBO is more like a Lyme where when we're talking about chronic Lyme, we might want to think about the immune system as the problem. We're talking about long COVID, it's the immune system that's the problem. When we're talking about SIBO, there's likely another problem as well. So I think that in terms of SIBO, you know, why talk about it even? Um, you know, doctors don't know that much about it, we don't really understand it, but that's not surprising because the microbiome is still being elucidated. You know, it's funny, but it feels to me like the microbiome is a has been, meaning it's been around for a long time and we still don't know that much. And I've already moved on to the fascia, which is again, just as complex a system and just as, uh, you know, omnipresent, right? You know, that as a chiropractor. Uh, ben. But yep. so there's a lack of consensus of even what SIBO is, and everybody has their new name on it, and it changes regularly. You know, I follow Allison Seebecker, et cetera, and just kind of keep up on that. But there's really no easy therapeutic algorithm, thank goodness, because I'm not about algorithms, or easy treatment plan, because everybody responds to different things. And so you're all familiar with that pain, or with the woman who looks pregnant um, with the SIBO belly. I saw one yesterday. I saw a woman yesterday who, you know, she said, I have all this fat. And I said, can you just pull up your shirt and let me have a look and, you know, felt it, but it was actually a very bloated belly and she thought it was fat. So people don't really know. We know that historically SIBO has been related to malabsorption syndromes, whether it's, you know, post-surgical uh, blind loop or post-gastric bypass. And I had a gentleman today who had a sleeve put in and said it was the best thing he ever did because he, um, he, um, you know, doesn't, he lost 75 pounds. And the interesting thing about what he said that I just love, because we take for granted that people really know what we're talking about, probably in California, they do more than in Boston. But at any rate, they, um, he said, you know, he's, a, he's from New York, he's in a country club, he's a real big, you know, wheeler dealer, high net worth person. And he said he was going through the, the buffet line at the country club recently, post his gastric bypass and some he has a small plate and somebody behind him, a woman had a big plate. And he said to her, how are you going to eat all that? How are you possibly? She, she said, this was you two years ago, dude. Like, what are you talking about? And he said, no, that couldn't have been me. Like I, he, he thought he always ate from a plate. And it's so interesting. I, I only eat from salad plates. I don't eat from a big nine inch, 12 inch plate. Right. But people don't, they're not aware. My point in that is that people really aren't aware of their behavior and helping them become aware is really helpful. But SIBO today, I mean, obesity is the number one problem. I talked about that at A4M and the immune system uh, module uh, this weekend in Boston. And obesity is a really, really big deal and we've got to address it. Obesity is probably an infectious disease problem in addition, but not alone. It's as complicated as SIBO. 
NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is fatty liver, uh, systemic sclerosis. You're bound to have SIBO if you have some of these other issues, including um, gastroparesis, which is functional from diabetes type 2. Irritable bowel gives you gastroparesis. Crohn's and celiac, any of these things. Not many people have celiac. They might have a non gluten celiac like syndrome, but not many people have celiac. They're very sick if they do, and they probably have a GI in their pocket. Um, understanding the connection between SIBO and other conditions is really important if you're going to come up with a treatment. So probably most of you have heard of Alessio Fasano. I hope so. You know, he's here in Boston. He runs a mucosal immunity center at the Mass General, but most importantly, he runs a massive lab. He doesn't really treat mucosal immunity. He doesn't see Clint. He doesn't really see many patients. I've referred patients to him, but he doesn't know the things that you know and that I know. So you will you would do a better job. But you know, obviously, all diseases begin in the gut. We really have to look at the gut because the gut is our interface with the outside world, and the gut is where we determine whether we're going to let. So it's the moat for to the castle. Is something going to get in? Is something going to not get in? And how are we going to keep it out? And what's going to happen if it does get in, but it really doesn't belong inside of us? You know, when things are entering, whether they're microbes or whether they're antigens, which often are proteins, or whether they're uh, foods that we're not, we don't tolerate, we really have to think about what's going to happen with the immune system. It is going to challenge the immune system. We have that to think about. But in addition, we have to think about the small molecules that are the metabolites of the microbes that live in and on us. So it's pretty complicated in terms of treating the gut. So you know that there's an extraordinary variation in the microbes that live on and in each of us. Our human DNA, we're almost 100%, 99.9% the same as your, the person next to you or all of us on this, on this call. But in terms of the, the gut microbiome, we might only share 10% with any one of us on this call. That's pretty important. That gives you a sense of the complexity of the microbiome. And that's why it's taking so long in order to understand the microbiome. So the microbiome is inherited from the mother primarily through birth. It's extremely dynamic. I mean, the dynamic nature of the microbiome, the dynamic nature of fascia, the dynamic nature of these complex systems that are connecting connecting the dots between various parts of our body is really important. Dy dynamic means it's always changing and hard to understand. It's complex. There are changes within um, an individual over a period of time. You can change the biome of your, your pharynx. You can change the biome of your mouth. You can change the biome of your vagina over time. And there's a lot of changes from one individual to the next individual. Um, the bi-directional communication that happens between the gut and the microbiota, you can see in you know, the microbiota in the, in the lower right, um, and the brain, which is down on the bottom uh, where it says clinical outcome, you know, there, we know that these are involved in the development of not only gastrointestinal disorders, the microbiome, even though it's in the gut, it can cause disorders of the gastrointestinal tract. It can cause disorders of the central nervous tract. I think of the gut really as the primary brain because it has to do so much work to protect the, the central nervous system. But autism, Parkinson's, and any all of these diseases that we um, kind of label as being central nervous system are all related to the microbiome. And you know we know that when someone has a brain injury, within minutes, minutes, you can see a leaky gut. If you have a, a gut injury, within minutes, you might see a leaky brain because there's constant communication, very dynamic and very quick and rapid. rapid. Um, in addition, as we mentioned, those small molecule metabolites that are, that are created by the microbiome that lives within you and that interact with the microbiome, the short chain fatty acids, they all modulate the immune system and they also modulate the metabolism. So it's pretty complex. So the question we have to ask is, is SIBO a disease entity or is SIBO a consequence of some other disorder? I would say that there's usually other things that are involved. I love this picture. I show it to my patients all the time in a screen in my office because I say, what do you think this is? And they think it's the mouth. 
So this is actually the single epithelial layer of the GI tract. Um, and I think it's pretty key because people understand the caries of the mouth and they understand how they can get breakdown in their teeth and in their gums. Well, they can understand the single epithelial layer of the GI tract as well. And um, when you think about it and you look at the outside on the upper right and you think about um, antigens, whether it's gluten or any other antigen, it could be whey protein, it could be any part of a food. There's multiple different antigens within one type of food. Wheat has multiple antigens, which we know, but all of those, when they cross through the barrier, particularly if it's leaky, as you see on the right side of the screen, they are going to activate the immune system. And once the immune system is activated through the antigen presenting cells, um, there's a, a responsibility of the immune system to determine what's self and what's non-self. But regardless, it's now going to flow throughout the entire body. It's going to flow to the central nervous system. It's going to flow to the joints. It's going to flow through the liver. It's going to, it's going to involve even the GI tract. What's outside the GI tract in the lumen is not really the GI tract, it's just passing by. So irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel disorder is the GI tract that gets affected by the immune system based on non-self antigens, whether they're food, food proteins and food antigens or microorganisms or byproducts, small molecules of those microorganisms that basically cross through the lamina propria, which is the, you know, the, it's like having the, it's like the gum, right? The gum of the... Um, the GI tract. So here we have, you know, study that Dr. Fasano is, wor is working on. It's an international study, multi, multi uh, clinic study, basically where they're looking at autism disorder and GI. And, and basically what they're finding is that hang on, um, it's open label and it's multi multi-centered and they're looking at microbiota transfer therapy on the composition of the microbiome of the gut or the microbiota microbiome is genome I'm used to saying that but it's really microbiota and they're seeing what happens with the GI and the autistic autism spectrum disorder symptoms in children who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And in doing this MTT therapy, the microbiota transfer therapy, they have shown that there's been a, about an 80% reduction in the GI symptoms at the end of the treatment, including significant improvements in symptoms of constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, abdominal pain. That's pretty a pretty big deal. And these improvements have persisted um, after the treatment stopped for you know, up to eight weeks. And specifically what they what they found, and I, I think that this is neither here nor there, but the overall bacterial diversity and the abundance of certain types of microbiota, you know, Prevotella, just full, full of Vibrio and other taxa increased um, with the MTT and these changes persisted. It could be other things as well, because again, I think that the microbiota are very uh, complex. So, you know, basically this extended duration treatment protocol appears to be a promising approach because we don't have many other things that can alter the gut microbiome and virome and help to improve the symptoms in children with ASD. Pretty important. Also, there is um, in anorexia, there is evidence that shows a causal role of an altered microbiome, you know, in some as we know, the psychiatric diseases, especially anxiety and depression, 100%, but also in anorexia, because not only these microbiota can, microbiota can influence um, neurotransmitters and the production of neurochemicals in the gut, but it can also in influence um, altered energy and how you're using it, get energy from food. Maybe you're, you don't, you get a lot of energy from food and you store it, or maybe you use the energy right away. You know how different people's metabolisms work, but it's certainly related to the microbiota. Hormonal changes are influenced bi-directionally with the microbiota, increased gut permeability, et cetera. So we know that there is a direct influence on brain and behavior, including anorexia. Oh, sorry about that. In, um, in patients. So I just think of the gut. I don't like to get into diagnoses, even though I'm physician. I don't like the uh, DSM. I don't like the ICD-9 or 10 or wherever we are. I just think of physiology. I think of pathophysiology. I think of aberrant physiology. What is going wrong? What is there that doesn't belong there? And how bad is it? And I 
would I hope that when I find something or when the patient comes in with symptoms and we begin to look that we find something that's not that bad, that's earlier in the progression of a problem, but not significant. So I just think of um, problems with the gut. I, I pretty much assume that there's some dysbiosis going on and which is basically just a disturbance in the microbiome. Um, so we can call it SIBO, LIBO, LIFO, whatever we want. I, you know, small intestinal microbial dysbiosis. I don't really care for me. For me, it's like, we don't know what the ideal microbiome is. However, we, we know that the um, lactobacillus species and the bifidobacter are very important. So we know a few things, but not everything. We do know, as we just talked about, that the human gut microbiota influences, phys all, I would say, all physiological processes. And the fascia influences all physiological processes. We're not talking about that today, but we've got to be thinking like, there's a lot we need to learn. So the microbiota influences our risk for GI or non-GI diseases, not just SIBO, but any disease, uh, whether it's type one diabetes, whether it's systemic sclerosis, whether it's lupus, the microbiota are involved for sure. So, and we know that there are strong associations, although not causation at this point, between the presence of certain microbes or the absence of certain microbes and specific clinical conditions. Um, there. Oh. So the microbiome or the gut uh, is one contiguous segment of tissue. We have to think about the mouth. We talk a lot about SIBO, but the mouth is the mouth and the stomach are big influences of whether or not we have SIBO. So we don't even think about the mouth. I ask all of my patients about their, their gum health, their teeth health, their um, uh, whether they've had implants and whether they they floss regularly. That is the most important question if we're even going to start with the GI tract because we ignore that. And I think oral uh, disease is pretty important for all of the diseases that the, that we're, we suffer with or all of the symptoms like SIBO that we suffer with. So we know it's complex. We know that there are distinct microbial niches along the different segments of the GI tract. So just pausing and thinking SIBO, SIMD, which is small intestinal microbial dysbiosis, it doesn't really matter. There's a perturbation in the microbiota. There may be a systemic disease that has caused that or that is that is um, as a result of it. But no matter what, there will always be a systemic disease connection. And so we have to think of what are the other functional problems that are going on so that we can understand and fix as many upstream issues or connected issues as we can very important. And I know you know that. So is there an ideal microbiota? That's a pretty tough question to answer. We've been trying to answer that for decades or more, maybe two decades. Um, I know that they, I've heard in Boston, of course, the talk is, is that they took Tom Brady's microbiota and they're trying to replicate it so that people can be like, him, which I find very <laughs> comical because I really don't want to be like Tom Brady. Um, but that said, I know that MIT definitely has a sample of his microbiome, and I know that uh, everyone's fascinated by it, except me, for sure. Um, but because it's complex, and really, he is not representative of any other individual, and we know that from the beginning of this talk. So microbes are much more numerous than we thought, and more important than we ever imagined, and they play a role in all aspects of our health. We're made up of 10 trillion human cells, but we're made up of 100 trillion microbial cells. So really, we are the guest of the, mic of the microbes. Um, so, and when we think about the ideal small intestinal microbiome, we know that each segment of the GI tract has a various, its own pH. The stomach has a very low pH. It's not the same pH in the small intestine or the esophagus. Um, each part has vari variable motility patterns, variable mucosal thickness, enzyme presence. The small intestine has a lot of enzymes and these factors influence the type and quantities of microbes in each area. The diversity of the stomach is predominantly H. pylori. You know, you know that H. pylori can be pathogenic, but it's also essential. So, and Jeff Bland did that work demonstrating that, that H. pylori, you know, probably has an essential role, but obviously when it's in abundance, when there's a bacterial overgrowth, then it can be problematic. Um, the small intestine has a low abundance of gram-positive 
aerobic bacteria, very important bacteria that like oxygen. And the large intestine has predominantly anaerobic bacteria that are, that are gram negative. So different sets of species inhabit different parts of the body where they play specialized roles but they play essential roles in the most fundamental processes of our lives that include digestion, immune, immune responses, immune regulation, which is really, really important. I would argue more important than digestion, but digestion is where we get the building blocks and the nutrients you know, for repairing our body. They also play a role in behavior. So now we have next gen sequence, sequencing, et cetera, and we can identify these species of microbes that live that we share a home with. And, you know, there's a, there's a massive 200 million or more human microbiome project, research project, that's helping to expand this knowledge, but it's pretty, it's pretty formidable. Um, so there are many unknown links between obesity, arthritis, autism, depression, and anxiety. And you can see the various parts of the skin, the urogenital tract, the colon, et cetera, and the different microbes that live there. And you're welcome to have and use any of my slides that you want. You can use anything that you hear from me. I have, you know, I, I'm here to teach you and whatever you take from it, it's yours. Um, and, and of course, now we also have the mapping of the small bowel by Dr. Yeah. Pimentel in his group. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Very important. You know, so SIBO, what is SIBO? It's really just nonspecific symptoms, right? You have a fever, you don't know what it's from because you don't have symptoms, particularly if you have type one diabetes. You know, I know I have type one diabetes and I know that when, you know, my blood sugar is resistant to the insulin that I'm taking, that something's going on. It might take two or three days to figure it out because I may not have symptoms, then they're nonspecific. And then we have to, you know, kind of figure it out or maybe it just resolves. So these nonspecific symptomatology things are pretty, complex. They're not really as simple as we want to make them out to be. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to understand them. We certainly should, but we should be thinking we should be, I, I like to go to 40,000 feet, 400, 4,000 feet and to four feet as often as I can in and out, zooming in and out, zooming in and out, asking questions, you know, taking the microscope and thinking about it, but really zooming out to have a treatment plan. So SIBO, you know, can be related to the quantity of microbes. That's one thing. It can be related to the type of microbe. It can be related to the metabolites or the small molecules that the microbes are secreting, like microbial transglutaminase. So you could have a microbe in your gut, gut that's making a small molecule that's a transglutaminase that is, is not measurable by measuring your transglutaminase tissue to see if you're reacting to gluten or to wheat or one of the antigens in the wheat. That's pretty interesting. So um, we have to think about the metabolites. That's complex. The metabolic alterations that even occur within the normal uh, microbes, microbiota that live within the gut. So, mm, sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, I gotta be very gentle with my fingers. I'm making this move. So it's a very heterogeneous condition, which is not a bad thing. I mean, it means that you probably can't go wrong if you start treating it in any way. There can be many different mechanisms by which people get um, a shift or a translocation in the bugs, whether it's from the vaginal, whether it's from the um, the rectum to the vagina. That's how they said UTIs always were caused, or whether it's from the colon back to you know a translocation into the uh, ileum. So there can be many different ways as this happen, or you can just feed these bugs and they can overgrow, right? So it's it's important to just be thinking about all of the possibilities. And you know, when something's heterogeneous, it's not easy to diagnose. I know that when I look at a low B12, I have to start thinking about the stomach and the small intestine. When I look at um, when when I see a patient who has a B12 of 300 on their, you know, in their serum. Um, or a high MMA or a high MCV, methylmalonic acid or MCV in their, in their CBC, then I have to be thinking something's going on in the gut. There's either a bacterial problem, there's an intrinsic factor problem, there's a hypochlorhydria problem, but there also, you know, there could be a SIBO problem. So when we see nutrient deficiencies, any of them, iron, I'm sure iron has to do something with the microbiota, D3, B1, B3, but they also have to do with other organ systems. So it's not just the microbiome, the microbiota, it's also to do with other organ systems as well that may be influencing the deficiency. Um, 
you could do a small intestinal aspirate culture. I've had people suggest that to do that for my patients, but that's a little invasive and I don't think it's necessary just to enumerate the bacteria because then what do you do about it, right? A breath testing is basically fermentation activity. So that's why we use glucose and lactulose for our breath testing to see what's fermented. And obviously we don't want to, you know, we know even our bread you know, when we grow, when we make bread, we put yeast and we add sugar and a good environment of moisture and warmth. And we, the yeast is going to go gangbusters and it's going to ferment. So molecular assessment, I think is great of the GI microbial ecology. Uh, I use E-lactate levels re regularly anyway. So there are a lot of diagnostic challenges and there are a lot of limitations um, in the, in an, obviously in an aspirate and also in a breath test, the biggest factor influencing how you look at the microbiota is what? Oro, cecal, transit, time, number one. And when we do this testing, there's no, nothing to account for the differences in oral, cecal, transit time. And that's pretty important. So, you know, the question that we have to think about is, you know, we don't want to misinterpret a, a breath test and it's pretty easy to misinterpret it unless you have somebody skilled like the the gentleman that we know that run the breath testing i actually am a a, um, a medical director of a of a SIBO breath testing company I, i'm not pushing any products because they're all related but you know when they see thousands and thousands of them over years they have a better sense of what's going on, in particular if, they, if they're able to talk to the clinician and understand the symptomatology. I don't have thousands experience with thousands of breath tests, you know, like um, my the owner of the company, Gary, does, but I have, you know, small exam, but he's, he's taught me a lot. But the question we have to ask is, should breath tests also be combined with some other uh, means of diagnosis, you know, estimating what's going on with the fermentation and where is it happening, et cetera? You know, here um, is a typical SIBO test result, and you can see um, the the this is a positive test result. And here is the the what you get when you look at the transit time from the beginning of the GI tract through the GI tract for over 180 minutes. But that doesn't really account for the the pace at which some which some but some people may digest their food in three days. Some And some people may digest their food very rapidly in three minutes. So you've got to be thinking about those aspects when you're thinking about whether, you know, what's going on with the, the bloated, distended abdomen um, of, the, of the quote, in quote, SIBO patient. Um, and the other problem is, is that when you have um, methane gas, and that's what you predominantly might diagnose, you've got to be cautious because if you have a lot of excess methane gas, you may have hydrogen gas as well, but you might not see that. Um, and depending upon where you think the problem is, if you think it's in the pro proximal uh GI tract, like the proximal uh, small intestine, then glucose is a better substrate. Um, and, you know, in getting people to um, follow the protocol is very difficult. And if you use lactulose um, and you've got a really rapid transit time, you may have an early rise in hydrogen gas and then you'll have a false positive. So you've got to be thinking about these things when you're using this testing. And you guys all know Pimentali's out by you. Um, breath testing, no matter what, it is useful. It is inexpensive. It is simple. It is safe. I mean, so it's not a bad diagnostic test in the evaluation of uh, these common GI problems. There is the new test that Allison, that you can do at home that Allison um, was talking about recently. I forget the name of it, but that's another, that's another option. It's all about- You mean the TRIO SMART breath test? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. also tests hydrogen sulfide. Exactly. Exactly. So we just talked about that. You can, you know, there's many ways of doing it, but regardless, for me, it's going to assume, I, I can assume if I see the bloating, like I saw in the patient I had yesterday, um, that there's something going on there. We can look at any kind of stool or SIBO testing that we want, but we also have to look at where it's happening in the GI 
test. And when we're doing breath testing, we just need to recognize, you know, that it's evidence of gas production, fermentation of undigested carbs. And we know how difficult it is with the FODMAPs, et cetera, and these other diets. So maldigestion, which is an enzymatic problem, poor sampling technique, you know, did the patient follow the testing uh, dietary restriction methods, et cetera. So that's important to be thinking about. You all probably know about the Rome versus the North American co consensus in terms of SIBO and the diagnosis. There's no reliable gold standard, um, but the, you know, we, everyone can agree that glucose breath testing and lactose breath testing are the least invasive way to look for um, a, a diagnosis of SIBO or what's the cause of the symptomatology. You all know about the molecular assessments and they're based on genomic and metabolomic methods. Um, that particular type of testing has demonstrated that all SIBO patients have an elevated streptogernus and sporadic overgrowth of a few types of gram-negative species, whether it's Klebsiella, Haemophilus, or Prevotella, but there can be a massive overgrowth or a sporadic overgrowth in a variety of jejunal samplings. So that's pretty important. And we know that people with, if a, if a, if we were to see in a pulmonary ICU with a, an influenza, someone who was a chronic alcoholic, significant alcoholic, we would expect to see Klebsiella and Haemophilus and different things in their lungs. You know, we can, we have to look at our patients and we know that when we see Klebsiella and, and Haemophilus in, and typical other types of uh, E. coli and Citrobacter in the GI tract, that we know that there is definitely some some problem going on, likely with digestion, likely with food and antigens, et cetera. So we also have to think about for a diagnosis of this dysbiosis and this symptoms, you know, what's going on with the innate defense? You all know about hy hypochlorhydria and gastric HCL, bile acids. There's a, you know, a, a lot of people have cholecystectomies and uh, there's a big need for bile acids. And there's a lot of webinars online about those, the different types of enzymes, whether it's gastric, because we know my patient today had a gastric bypass again. And, you know, he, he got rid of blood, he got rid of all of his blood sugar meds. He had type two diabetes. He got rid of all of his blood pressure meds. So think about what that tells you about what's going on in the, the uh, mucosa of the stomach. Pretty significant hormones that we don't even think about, like cholecystokinin, that we can't really even measure, somatostatin, you name it. Um, so the gastric secretions, the pancreatic sec sec secretions, the motility, the transit time, secretory IgA, does somebody have an IgA deficiency? Um, if they have a high IgA level, then that is likely to be appropriate. But what happens in the mouth versus in the, the gut? Something to really understand. And the competence of the ileocecal valve. How could you know that? So you've got to ask them, what's your past medical history and discern the past medical history from listening to their stories and their symptoms. Have they had pancreatitis. I worked in the morgue at the Mass General as a pathologist for a year, um, you know, making diagnosis of people who die within 24 hours of admission to the hospital. And I can tell you from age 15, you know, 30, 50, 60 years of age and older, I didn't see anybody who didn't have diverticula. So it's pretty rampant, even though people get, you know, ex I have diverticular disease. I would say, you know, in my mind, given what I saw at the Mass General and even very young people who uh, who succumbed and f died, there was a lot of diverticular in their colons. I had to run the entire colon, cut the entire colon, colon out at colon open, you know, flush it, wash it, spread it out, look at it, the entire GI tract. And it's pretty interesting to see how many people have diverticular disease. Fistulas can be undiagnosed. I mean, people can have a, a fistula could feel like a little paper cut. Someone may not know. Uh, it's very important. PEI, it's di on the radio in Boston. I don't know about there, but they're basically advertising, educate your doctor about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. The, the medical community in Boston is pretty pretty big on diagnosing pancreatic endocrine in, insufficiency, or maybe not, because the A1C can get to the sixes before they tell you have diabetes, but exocrine insufficiency is pretty common. Uh, certainly in anyone who has pancreatic endocrine insufficiency, whether it's type two or type one diabetes, um, but 
I would say hand in hand, anyone with type one will likely have an exocrine insufficiency as well. Autonomic neuropathy, um, scleroderma, or any of the autoimmune um, conditions, fatty liver, chronic immunodeficiency with low secretory IgA or anything like that. So you've all seen this before. You've all seen this diagram. I mean, it tells you the significance of what's going on in the lumen. There's no part of, no space. The lumen is a space, an open space that we think of, right? Uh, just a big tube through the body, but there's no space in the body that doesn't have a function. And if you look at the non-specific barriers, uh, the bacteria, the microbiota, the gastric acid, the mucus, the mucin, the defensin, the, a variety of enzymes, secretory IgA, the the um, the um, the lamina propria, the the oh I'm blanking on what these little the cilia like you know that get brushed away if you have diarrhea, et cetera. But there's so many nonspecific barriers. There's so many specific immunological barriers. And then there's that epithelial layer with those tight junctions that we'll look at a little bit more. But I mean, we've got to look at every aspect of this in order to understand what's causing uh, dysbiosis of the GI tract. You cannot get away with not looking at every aspect if you want to be thorough and, and give your patient the best, most effective treatment. So there are predisposing functional diagnosis, migrating motor complex, I mean, in motility, if you think about the MMC and how it's supposed to happen, you know, it's supposed to occur, this, this housekeeping process um, on the next slide occurs, you know, in a cyclical pattern, mostly when we're not eating at night, when we're resting and we're doing our autophagy and our cleanup, it clearing the residue, all the residue from the day of the GI tract. Have you, have you ever asked your patients if they wake up at night and eat? I can tell you, if you ask them, you would be shocked to know how many people think that the gurgling that they feel or hear in their GI tract in the middle of the night means they need to get up and eat. There are so many people that eat in the middle of the night. It's amazing, but they're not going to have an, a healthy MMC because when you have food in the GI tract and you're, and you're attempting to digest it, you're not going to be able to activate the MMC. It's the phase three of, uh, of motility and it's a secretory phase in order to move the contents of the lumen of that space, that GI space from the stomach to the duodenum through the ileum into the colon, yada, yada. And you know, there's a lot of gastric and pan pancreatic secretions that are going on probably more than we even realize. So you know, the MMC, I don't know anybody who doesn't eat late at night and isn't still doing digestion when their MMC components and phase should be activated. Hypochlorhydria PPIs, we know how common they are. They're now over the counter. It's insane. If you can just take a little PPI and feel better, you don't have to pay attention. You can then go and eat whatever you want and continue to eat. So but even without PPIs, hypochlorhydria is a problem in and of itself. PEI we talked about, and, and even hypothyroidism is going to affect the motility of the functional gastric per, per gastromotility, whether it's causing some functional paresis, gastroparesis, et cetera. And it's variable day in and day out. Um, so the MMC, we talked about the circadian rhythm. It is not regulated by one thing, it is regulated by many things. It's extremely con complex. The enteric nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve, for goodness sake, whose vagus nerve is healthy, right? All of the GI hormones, the, those ones in the stomach, somatostatin, cholecystokinin, substance P, you name it, ghrelin, um, serotonin, pancreatic polypeptide. There is a very complex system that we, we don't even talk about these type of hormones ever. We just keep talking about the same hormones over and over. Um, so there's a lot of variability for the same person in um, the migrating mo motor complex and its activation and between people. So it's hard to understand. Um, and if anybody has an autoimmune disorder like lupus and uh, systemic uh, progressive systemic sclerosis or scleroderma or anything like that, Crohn's, diverticular disease, hypothyroidism, those all affect um, motility as well as stress. I mean, if you have um, elevation, elevated activation of the HPA axis, you can get gastric emptying as well. I mean, reduced gastric emptying, excuse me, gastroparesis as well. The medications that people take, uh, whether they've had, whether they have surgery or radiation, I have a 50 ish year old man who had radiation when he was uh, 20. Actually, he's probably in his mid 50s now. Uh, he's been my patient from the very first day I opened, and um, he was radiated 
so 35 years ago and he's got so many adhesions and so much lack of function. And honestly, right now he's gotten his kidney to his chagrin. He, he has a panhypo pit and his kidney and his, and his, um, his kidney is failing to function and his gut has been failing to function. And it's not because he has primary gastric uh, GI disease or primary kidney disease. It's all from the radiation and the influence of the radiation, you know, all around the mouth, the neck, the, the thorax, et cetera. It's, it's so sad, but nobody pays attention to it. He's just like, okay, you know, nobody even don't worry about it. We'll tell you when you need to be on peritoneal dialysis and then you need, you're not going to get a kidney transplant at that point. So we have to be thinking about these things, but I'm sure for him, these are part of the issue. So, you know, any patient who goes in and has an endoscopy, they're going to have some form of gastritis. It may be chronic atrophic. It may be chronic inflammatory. Every single person is going to have gastritis. And guess what happens? They get put on a PPI, even if they don't have gastritis, doesn't matter. So hypochlorhydria um, can cause some of the things that are seen on endoscopy that docs aren't aware of. Um, if fasting can cause hypochlorhydria. So the patients are obviously fasting when they get, um, when, when they do a lot of their testing. So there's a seven fold increase. The first conversation to have with your patient is how often did they take a PPI? When was the last time they needed a PPI, et cetera. So we've got to be thinking about that. Um, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, EPI, PEI, however you want to say it, you could put the exocrine first or the pancreatic first. That's definitely related to SIBO because if you're not breaking down the sugar, the food with all of the different enzymatic um, uh, chemicals that are secreted from the pancreas, from an exocrine perspective, then you're going to have malabsorption and you're going to leave a lot of food in the, in the space of the, the gut for bugs to munch on. Um, and hypothyroid, is a mel it was shown actually in a large retrospective not the best type of study but cohort that l thyroxine itself was shown to be a strong predictor of SIBO stronger than even having hypothyroidism that's pretty wild and that wasn't that long ago um so what are the strategies for treating SIBO? You have to look at their diet. They have to be very, uh, they have to be low in carbs. You know, we want to be thinking about fibers and things like that. Certainly we've got to be cautious. We don't want to induce so, uh, I think most people would prefer diarrhea over constipation, but we've got to, you're not absorbing as many nutrients. So we've got to be thinking about what the starting point is of the patient. Lactulose can be used as a prebiotic. You can use a 10, 20, 30. You can use a 10 gram of 10 BID gram lactulose as a prebiotic, and it will lower any translocation, improve transit time, and also act as a barrier. So that can be a good, um, something to start with in your constipation patients. You certainly want to restore their nutrients because the GI tract and all of these functions of the epithelial cells will need nutrients in order to function. Um, so depending upon what nutrients that they need and depending upon what their symptoms are, you can determine how you want to get that. But I think the elemental diet is a great way to get nutrients. So you all know this SIBO uh, protocol from Norm Robillard. Um, you know, you can start with diet. I always start with diet, no matter what I do, because if the patient doesn't want to help me, and I believe lifestyle is a really important thing, if they don't want to help me help them, then that's a hard thing to do, right? If they, if the diet isn't helpful, you know, by cutting carbs, et cetera, FODMAPs, whatever you want to try, an elemental diet and, and a period of rest for the GI tract, not complete rest because they'll get nutrients through the elemental diet is a wonderful option. Um, you can start with herbal antibiotics or you can start with antibiotics. I work with my patient. I have patients that come in and say, no, I took rifaximin and that helped. And that's what I want right now. I bargain with them a little bit and try to get them to at least pay attention to the food, but they are insistent. Most patients will insist that it's not their food, yada, yada, yada. But typically we will get eventually we'll get to talking about the food, but maybe I start with rifaximin, maybe I start with herbs, um, you know, something that is going to uh, be like a wormwood or something like that, uh, antifungal, whatever I think is an underlying issue, depending upon their symptoms, but I'm definitely going to use diet and one of the others along here, one of the other treatments along this. So 
we know that fasting is not good for the mucosa, for the single epithelial layer. And that's long understood. I mean, even for hospitalists, et cetera, fasting is not good for the, you will, you will get atrophy of your, of your mucosal layer. And that's not the goal. The goal is to have it robust and functioning. So that's why we don't really want gut rest. And it is better to have something going through the gut in order to continue to restore these layers. Um, so an elemental diet uh, using the physician's elemental diet program. It is, you know, it's a medical food. It's balanced with nutrients. It contains what I like are the free form amino acids. I mean, I think antigens are the primary problem when we think about what's causing a problem in this non-specific barrier and that's breaking down the specific immunological barrier. It's often antigens that can come from proteins or you know, in wheat, it can come from a carb or it can come from a protein source. So there's a lot of different formulas on the market. You don't want a lot of sugar. You don't want a lot of glucose. You don't want a lot of carb. So bravo to IT for changing uh, the formula a little bit. Um, you don't want too much fiber. You definitely want some MCTs, but it's really important to be thinking about what is in it. So free yeah, I, I just like to point out, there's a number of products on the market that are essentially meal replacements, you know, typical sort of protein powder with some carbs and some fat and, and marketed as um, elemental diet. And they're, they're not. That's amazing because Ben, because I have not even seen those, to be honest with you, I don't know where I am, but I, but I never think of any protein powder or anything like that being like an elemental diet. And certainly you can get a sense of whether or not people are absorbing the amino acids or they're able to even break down the protein powder, but an elemental diet is in a pretty, um, you know, has a lot of micronutrients in it, in addition to the basic foods. So when we eat, we eat fat, carb, and protein. It's the fat that we should be using aerobically in order to make energy like ATP fuel. It's the glucose or the carb that we should be using. And ideally a carb with fiber, like a, a vegetable, um, or a fruit with fiber, something like that, that we're using to, to get, you know, the sugar under anaerobic conditions, but we don't, if we had lactate, we don't want to have to use lactate because it requires a lot of oxygen and you'll never for energy for ATP production, because you'll never make, you know, adequate ATP if you're, if you're relying on, on lactate. So uh, carbs are not a bad thing. Fat is not a bad thing. Nothing's a bad thing. We need everything in balance and we need to understand why we have it. I'm glad to hear that the carbs have been reduced in the physician's elemental diet, Steve. Thanks so much. Um, and that the proteins have been increased uh, or the amino acids have been increased. The micronutrient levels, I mean, there's no better way, you know, than to get these with the amino acids because that's how you're going to make the chemicals that you need, whether they're neurochemicals, you're going to join your amino acids using together using the B6. If you've got glutamine and you don't have B6, you're not going to be making GABA, right? So it's very important to, to just think logically about these things. This is not, this is not like rocket science. Um, and here, when we're looking at the epithelial layer, these just single cells, and we're thinking about the actin filaments, et cetera, on the left, and the occludin zonulin just being this, the laces that are holding, holding the two cells together, but really it's the actin and talin. And once the actin and talin begin to unravel, the occludin zonulin will unravel. And you can see there's a variety of different antigens, whether they're bacterial, microbial, cytoskeletal, you know, gluten, dairy, whatever they are, these food antigens, these microbial antigens, they can either come through the cell in a paracellular way, or they can come between the cells. But if they're coming through, they're definitely going to be coming between because the occludin zonulin is going to unravel. And so the laces of the two cells are not going to be held together. Now, I don't really measure a lot of zonulin in the beginning when we heard about it, what is it, eight or I don't even know, 10 years ago, zonulin was sexy. But now I'm, I'm much more interested in understanding the antibodies to the occludin, the antibodies to the zonulin, the LPS, et cetera. I think it's much more valuable to know because you'll know that there's something going on. And I really like, you know, the elemental diet. You can see here, if you're having a whey protein, you have to digest it like on the right. So traditional food proteins, they all require digestive enzymes to break down that food. And if you haven't fixed the enzymatic problem or the HCL problem or the bile problem, whatever the problem is, that's also related with this, these symptoms, then you're going to worsen the symptoms. So for me, it's a no brainer to it's better than TPN to give somebody elements that are 
or nutrients that are in the elemental form. So I really like that. You can use elemental diets any way you want. You can use them just as a, you know, for, again, like I told Ben earlier, I treat a lot, a lot of very young wounded warriors. I have a young wounded warrior I saw yesterday is 25 years old. Um, it's amazing to me, you know, that he's even already been in the army and the out and he's already out discharged because while in, while um, deployed, he had a triple A, he had a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm dissection. And this kid basically died and was brought back to life. And he's got multiple issues. Again, kidney absorption, kidney issues that are really significant that no one's paying attention to. He's sugar issues, et cetera. He's got gut symptoms. So he's on elemental diet. Um, and I just think it's a great way for these, these um, warriors who are so young to get, to get them some basically healthy amino acids um, in its most elemental form. If you're using them with someone who has SIBO, you, I would say there have been patients, not many that are willing to do elemental diets fully. I have one patient who was willing to do it for three to four weeks and get her calories through elemental diet because her symptoms were so severe, but that's very rare. Normally, I have to replace one meal with the elemental diet or a snack with an elemental diet. And typically, I'll do a partial elemental diet. Um, it's very rare for me to use it just for three days. I may be using it for two weeks. I may be using it for a month. But generally, as a partial, we're talking about the foods that they're going to eat at the same time as the elemental diet. And we're coming up with a list that is acceptable for that person. It's very individualized. I don't have a one size fits all. I don't just say FODMAPs. I don't do that. I spend a lot of time with the patient understanding uh, you know, a lot of their other symptoms, whether they have histamine issues, uh, whether they respond to histaminergic fruit foods in a negative way, et cetera. The most important thing in my mind with an elemental diet is that when you recommend a patient to have the powder, that they drink it slowly. They don't think dr think about something that they're going to down in two minutes and gulp and it's gone, throw away the, you know, the container. I don't mean of the powder, but of the drink. Basically, you want them to drink it slowly. You want them to drink it over a time period, a bare minimum of 30 minutes, but likely an hour so that they can absorb those nutrients over time and not only absorb them, but assimilate them appropriately. We, nothing needs to have a dumping on it. You know, <laughs> We don't need to dump a lot of nutrients in any system because that as well can create functional gastroparesis. But I, you know that patients will not feel well and they'll have other symptoms if they take it too quickly. You know, so a 14 to 21 day program for SIBO has been studied and we, sh people, the normalization of the lactulose breath test is pretty significant compared to normals um, with respect to using the elemental diet. So this has been studied and that's why there, it's backed up by evidence. Um, for Q Crohn's, I've used it in a Q Crohn's um, and basically it's better. It's as safe as a uh, TPN or anything else. So wonderful. I've used it in chronic Crohn's. I've used a half element diet. I had a patient that was in the hospital here at Mass General um, with severe Crohn's with a pick line and was getting food through there. She was eager to get out. She came out. We did a number of peptides orally and sub-Q. And we also did elemental diet and shakes and she healed. And that was probably four years ago. And she has not been back to the hospital with an exacerbation. Grazie a Dio. So, By the way, what peptides do you find most effective for Crohn's? In her acute phase and in the active phase, you know, she was pretty acute still when she got out with the pick line, et cetera. We used, um, we used BPC sub-Q. She could tolerate food and pills, so we used BPC orally. We also used, and that, that way there I'm thinking of treating the outside of the body through the GI tract in the space of the lumen. And then I'm thinking of getting it into the body through the sub Q. We also use thymosins as well um, for her. So she alternated the thymosins and took BPC. And honestly, she continues to do that. And it's been, you know, almost five years later with no exacerbation. Mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful thing. So you know that these are a variety of the mechanisms um, that the elemental diet you know, will work through, basically it will um, improve the nutrient status. 
uh, help to reduce antigen exposure because of the nature of the elemental diet, reduce uh, inflammatory mediators, cytokines, pro-inflammatory pro leukotrienes, et cetera, reduce permeability over time, over time, um, modulate the immune system response, help with mucosal re repair, particularly because of the bowel rest. And we know that there's a lot less endotoxemia. And whenever there's injury, and I talk about this a lot in my peptide lectures, you know, we are going to get deposition of adipose tissue. Injury will, within a month, deposit adipose tissue. And so having adipose tissue surrounding the gut is not going to, you know, fare well for anybody. So we want to treat any inflammatory issues, supply the building blocks and the nutrients and the energy um, and the essential fatty acids in order to reduce uh, a bad outcome in repair. So this is another, pardon me, this is another way of looking at, you know, what mechanisms of the elemental diet. There's multiple ways of looking at it. You can read all of these on your own. These are the same things that we just talked about. Decreased need for pancreatic enzymes, et cetera. So pardon me, I'm trying to be gentle. The efficacy of the elemental diet is great, but it's even better if you understand whether it's a diarrheal SIBO, whether it's a secretory SIBO, or if it's a constipation. And so there will always be other supportive treatments that are necessary when somebody has a bacterial or a SIBO symptoms. Always, always, always. I'm not sure if you all, because you're on the West Coast, are familiar with Jerry Mullen. He is a physician at Johns Hopkins, and he did a head-to-head -head study looking at you know, comparing the treatment of herbal antibiotics and antibiotics like rifaximin for the treatment of SIBO. He's a lovely man as well. And basically, you know, what he found is that herbal therapies are at least, at least, are at least as effective as rifaximin for resolution of SIBO uh, by lactose breath test and that they appear to be just as effective as triple antibiotic therapy for SIBO rescue therapy for people who didn't respond to rifaximin. So, I mean, obviously you know, th this can be repeated. And here we're basically looking at, you know, you know, different places uh, along the GI tract that we have to be thinking about. We talked about this past medical history and understanding, and then um, some of the factors that may influence if people have had chronic antibiotics, um, et cetera, sugar, alcohols, what food they're eating, um, bile, et cetera. So pretty self-explanatory. It's a great paper, actually. Let me try to get to the next slide. And then he he looked at all of the different antibiotic regimens and, and you know, basically elucidated those that people have tried for SIBO. And then he compared a variety of uh, herbal antimicrobials with the rifaximin. You know, so he used things like Chinese skull, skull cap, berberine, uh, rhizome extract. You're familiar with all of these things, licorice root, ginger rhizome, rhubarb root, acacia, artemisia, et cetera. So any, there, every, many companies have uh, products with um, these particular ingredients in them, some thymus uh, parts, et cetera. So I think that it's really important um, to, to be thinking about what herbal antimicrobials you might use. So here's some herbal antimicrobials, the berberine complex uh, and the Paragard. Um, you wanna be thinking about, you know, whether or not your, pa your patients are likely to have um, uh, parasites. Are they likely to have yeast? Are they likely to have um, uh, other, other bacteria, gram negative or otherwise? And so all of these products will have a proprietary, the proprietary blend of the company of different herbs and extracts that, you know, are very helpful. Um, the migrating motor complex, we already talked about that and its role in health and disease. It's very essential. And motility activator, um, something with some ginger, artichoke, D-limonene, 5-HTP. We know that that's made in the gut. And we know that, you know, we've used Zelnorm and other things when people have irritable bowel, which is 5-HTP. Uh, 
um, a serotonin, serotonergic medication. So, and vitamin C I use all the time to tolerance and AC to tolerance. I use those all the time, all the time to tolerance because there's so many other benefits with NAC and vitamin C. Vitamin C lowers blood sugar. It's wonderful. Uh, here's D-limonene and safety and clinical applications. Uh, terpenes are very effective uh, for the gut as well. Um, so probiotic therapy to do or not to do. I mean, I don't think that the, the data is conclusive in any way, shape or form. So if you have definitely, if someone comes into me and they have a diarrhea, they have diarrhea predominant SIBO or an issue, I will usually try a probiotic with them. But when they have a constipation, um, the first constipation-based SIBO, the first thing I need to do is get their bowels moving. We've got to start to clean out the bowels. So the research is all over the map, and I don't think there's any one way of doing it. I certainly don't think that I have the right way of doing it. So, you know, we've got to be thinking about all of the different uh, interactions of the body and the interrelatedness of the body and understanding how are we going to treat SIBO. It is not an entity in and to itself, just like I don't think chronic Lyme is. I mean, I think chronic Lyme or chronic COVID, those are immune system disorders and we've got to understand those. So we can do a little case study here. 38 year old man came to my practice. Let me go back one. Uh, he came to my practice in January of 2018, but in the summer of 2017, he began to get ill. I did not see him for six months or more. And basically he was out of the country. He came back and he said his gut had never been the same. He went to see his PCP. He was having explosive diarrhea. He was having diarrhea nocturnally. He was exhausted. He was irritable. He was bloating. Um, there was no blood testing done and really no stool testing done. So they put him on a simple carbohydrate diet FODMAPs like, and he had no improvement. Then they gave him flagell for 10 days and he had no improvement. So this is all through the course of, you know, July, August through December, when he finally ultimately made an appointment to come in in January in my practice. He had a typical conventional stool test in December 17 at his primary care office, primary care doctor's office that showed C. diff toxin B, and he was treated with Vanco at that time uh, for 10 days. And Despite that, he continued to have symptoms. And so his PCP was recommending another course of Vanco. And he had a friend, actually his friend was the woman with the with the um, the Crohn's colitis that I had treated before. And she said, you, you know, enough is enough. You've got to go see a doctor that can help you. So he came in and he said that he had fatty liver. Um, he was taking a line as a, as a probiotic. Um, he had diarrhea, bloating, gas stools all, all 24 hours a day, fatigue. He also had muscle pain. Obviously we know that there are many symptoms. Any symptom can go along with it. But I found the interesting thing is when somebody has diarrhea, I have never had a SIBO-like patient who has diarrhea that lost weight. They all seem to gain weight, which is quite interesting. And maybe it's that adipose tissue deposition um, as well. Um, they all gain weight. So what I did just while we did some testing was I said, hey, let's go rest your gut. And, you know, with one, you can have one meal a day, pick the meal that you're going to have, but try to rest your gut for the majority of the 24 hour window. And then we'll give you the elemental diet as a second meal. And then I did give him probiotics, um, VSL actually. Um, oopsie. So, so in, in that case, did you have him to use the elemental diet as many times as he wanted or just no, added that one meal? No, one meal, okay. one meal. Mm -hmm. It was temporary while we waited for labs, labs to come back. So, you know, here we see his B12 at 295. Um, his folate's not even, it's not useful because it's a serum folate. His testosterone is low. He's only 38. We know there's a bunch of things going on. His cortisol is six as well. So he's got some significant stress that's been going on for some time, right? His AA, we look at his essential fatty acids and his AA EPA ratio. This is probably one of the highest AA EPA ratios, the bottom red mark there at 37 that I've ever seen. He has an omega-3 index that's, you know, two, which should be five. So he's very deficient in essential fatty acids, which are 
basically, you know, going to affect the cell membranes of all of the cells. So he is markedly inflamed, not absorbing. Definitely, you know, we, we know that he has fatty liver. We know he probably has something going on in the stomach as well because of the low B12 stomach and small intestine. He has significant insulin resistance with an insulin score of 37, which is very important. And that's not surprising because whenever there's a mo- microbial um dysregulation, you're going to have insulin resistance, whether or not you have um, diabetes. But the point is, is that we have to correct this. What is a normal insulin level? So, you know, we, I talked with the, you know, an interactive session in the immune competence um, module at A4M this weekend in Boston. And people don't really even know a normal insulin level fasting obviously should be two, but with a healthy meal, a very healthy meal of, let's say it was a dinner of vegetables, you know, some olive oil. What I had, I had tonight, I had kale, roasted kale in a wood oven. I had some broccoli and I had some um, branzino with, and mostly with olive oil. And then I had a salad with some mint and some lettuces and cucumbers and that with olive oil. That was my dinner tonight. My insulin level with a dinner like that, that I just described should literally be under 10 single digits. So an insulin level of 37 at any point in time is completely inappropriate. It means that he has, he needs a high insulin in order to get his blood sugar to be normal. So a glucose on its own is never beneficial because you have no idea what insulin you needed to get to that level. And I know you all know this, but I'm, I'm trying to drill home a point that glucose is not very useful. We can see he's got liver function abnormalities. He's got an inflammatory process going on in his liver with his AST and his ALT. He's got a bilirubin that's elevated. uh, And these are really important numbers to know. We know there's a lot more going on than just, um, you know, the diarrhea and the bloat, et cetera. Here is the stool test that I did on him in January of 2018 when he was uh, told to take the second course of Vanco. He did not have C. difficile. So that's important to know. And I'm glad he didn't go through that, that second course of SIBO. We used a glucose substrate because I thought there was something proximal going on. And definitely we saw that there was some SIBO, positive SIBO. We looked, I'm so sorry about my... Um, Okay, so we looked at the antigens and you're all familiar with Cyrex and looked to see what was going on, but it's not surprising anybody with diarrhea for the length of time that he has, he's basically gonna have no brush border. He's not gonna be able to identify or keep anything out of his system. And this is meaningful, but still relatively meaningless because when he repairs his lumen, his epithelial cells um, and the crypts of those epithelial cells, he should be, Maybe he'll be okay, but for now, I'm definitely, you know, going to recommend that he not go on any box product, no gluten-free product, no buckwheat, sorghum, hemp, um, no rye, no barley, uh, no wheat at this point in time, because they're too antigenic and that's an issue. Eggs, et cetera, you can see from this testing that anything in the yellow and the red, really, he's got to really simplify his diet. Um let me go here. You know, so here's where you see the transcellular and the pericellular roots uh, that anything can get in. The antigens, the food antigens get in through the per- pericellular when the zonulin is broken apart. But you can also have the microbes that are coming in um, transcellularly. And we know that within the epithelial cell, every single cell in the body has actin. And actin is responsible for what in that in a cell will, regulates the cell across that membrane of the of an epithelial cell increased levels of actin suggest that there's damage because the actin is not you know together where it needs to be to be holding the the to keeping the integrity of the cell and so we know that when there's increased actin levels that there is a lower barrier function increased permeability and that there's cell damage zonulin is the gatekeeper between the cells so actin within the cells zonulin between the cells and basically it is there for transport of nutrients into the body, but it, we know that an increased zonulin indic- indicates that there's a com- compromised lining of the of the gut and that there is leaky gut. And then once we get that um, pericellular roots of antigen penetration, we know that they're going directly and activating the immune system. So pretty important to understand. Um, 
Uh, here we did another test, just looking at a stool sample. And oftentimes the tests I use depend upon the insurance of the patient, the po pocketbook of the patient and what they're willing to spend. Um, but I try each test to see you know what I think of them. This is a test again from California that I that I've used and you can see the the microbes that are um, delineated uh, here and basically looking at the health of the mi microbiome and we can see what's high and what's low and we can see the level of, of evidence with associations with either IBD or irritable bowel. And then the recommendations, the recommendations you can either follow them or not. Generally they're pretty good, but um, it depends on when you're going to start them, right? When you're going to start the recommendations that they might have or you might want. So this patient has lower short chain fatty acids. So he doesn't have a lot of good metabolites that are coming from his microbes, his microbiota. He obviously has leaky gut as we would know. Um, he has TMO levels that are probably increased based on the clostridial species and the other species that are elevated here that and I'm not really worried about them affecting his cardiovascular health. I'm just worried about his overall health. Uh, but we do know that TM TMAO can be a precursor to early cardiovascular disease. Kathleen, which stool <laughs> test is this? This is vibrant. Okay. Um, mm, mm, yep, that's plenty. Okay, so... You know, he's SIBO positive. We know he has increased intestinal permeability. He has antibodies to actin, antibodies to zonulin. I would expect every food to be as positive as it is. He's got low diversity in his gut. Um, so we did a half an elemental diet, just one meal a day. He also had another meal a day that he could choose. And we, we talked about, we did, we took away the antigens that we know. And also based on his testing, we gave him some antimicrobial herbs. We gave him B12 sub Q and folate sub Q as well. But the reality, because we have folate here, but the reality is, is that you don't need to do everything at once. I gave him B12 and folate sub Q because um, I basically, I didn't give it to him every day. These I did not give every day. I gave once a week. Um, vitamin D, you can also inject to in order to get good absorption of these things and not to uh, use the gut for that. Just use the elemental diet for that. So we basically do, I don't try to win the game in the first minute of the first quarter. The goal is to help this gentleman heal and repair in the last seconds of the last quarter of the game. It is Thursday night football guys. Um, <laughs> but so the bottom line is you can, you can do it at any pace you want, but the pace will depend upon how the patient is doing. What symptoms are they having? The people I saw today, for example, I did multiple treatments on them um, for GI, for pain, for other things. They went home with, I did treatments here, injections here, peptides here. They went home with whatever they went home with. I will check in with them on Sunday to determine what we're going to do on Monday. So it's one of the natures of my practice. I don't, these are the variety of things that I will do, but um, you know, you can do it any way you want. So just gut restoration with supportive supplements like L-glutamine, zinc carnosine, MSM, aloe, okra, DGL, NAG, all the things that we talked about previously. But the most important thing thinking about this gentleman and thinking about any of the patients that you have is treat the whole person as opposed to just a disease process. I think about a barren physiology and what part of the physiology is not functioning. Not that it's pathologic at this point, but why, what's not functioning well? How can I restore that so I can prevent pathophysiology? And that would I, that's what I would encourage you guys to do. Um Mm -hmm. That was great. Um, when when do you decide to use a partial um, elemental right. versus uh, doing a full two weeks, just elemental? Oh, because patients are very unlikely to do it. That's the main reason. Oh, so okay. So really don't love to do that. So if you have a patient that's willing to do, I always start with small things. Like I'm not, again, speaking of any game, I'm going to go out and get a, a score. I'm going to try to get three points on the board. So I may say, let's just start with three days. You check in with my staff or me, let me know how you're doing. Can you do another three days? I never go big. I always go small and try to win big. Okay. Um, some of the questions have come in. One question is from Joellen. Um, yeah. If the patient has constipation, would it be a good idea to do the elemental diet? And I think she's probably thinking the fact that there's no fiber in there. 
Yeah, well, fiber can be problematic for people with constipation. So we don't want to start with a lot of fiber. Honestly, like I may even start with a bottle of mag citrate. I'm going to start with anything. I may tell them to make a jug with vitamin C in it and drink that vitamin C along with a, a magnesium. I'm definitely going to clean out the bowel. I want to start fresh. You know, I am cleaning out the bowel before I start with anything. I think you can do an elemental diet if you want to get them nutrients for sure, even if they have constipation. But most important, because the bugs aren't going to feed on the elemental diet, it's not going to happen. Right. So the reality is, is that you need to help the patient empty the bowel. It, even if you get to that point, they're going to love you because there's nothing like an empty bowel if you've had, if you're feeling full of shit, part of my expression, but it's, <laughs> you know, I was on the plane going to California once. This is a long time ago. Literally, this is more than a decade ago. I sat next to this over, I was in the middle seat. Oh, I know I don't do the middles anymore, but I was in the middle seat and this heavy set man is sitting next to me. And, you know, he knew I was in medicine and functional medicine. And he said, you know what my doctor told me? This is what he tells me like on the plane. He said, I'm full of 35 pounds of shit. I'm like, oh, your doctor <laughs> is <probably really> smart. <laughs> you know, I can't believe the guy like knows this. He knows this. He's sitting next to me. You think I want to sit next to the guy full of 35 pounds of shit? I'm Did like, he have oh. orange hair? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but can uh, you believe it? <laughs> well, the other thing is, um, you know, if the elemental diet helps to starve the archaea that are causing the methane, we know the methane gas is what causes the constipation. So it should help with right. the constipation for right. that reason. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you you talked, you mentioned CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, and somebody asked uh, about diagnosing CFO testing. Yeah, I mean, CFO, I think, is pretty pretty rampant to be honest with you so there are you know, everybody has has many fungal forms in them but i do a variety of testing on most of my patients you know i really try to pick and choose with the money but i want to know that there are there's consistency and cfo is going to produce gases right so you're going to have gases that are flowing through the system you're probably going to have a lot more lactate you're probably going to be more anaerobic it definitely sugar is going to be a problem. You're, you can look on organic acid testing and see if there's a propensity towards fungal, mold, aspergillus, you name it. And right. even just with that testing alone, if patient describes the symptoms, for me, they have it. It doesn't matter. Right. You know, if they have symptoms and I see on an organic acid test, a propensity to higher yeast forms, you know, no testing is perfect, but I'm going to treat that. Right. I think a lot of people use organic acid testing for yeah. fungal. Um, yeah. You mentioned motility activator and somebody asked, what's the best protocol for using it? Motility activator alone won't get somebody with a methane induced constipation to be active, but the goal is how do we keep them active, right? So once we move all of that stool out and we get, we, you know, reduce that constipation and I know that I've had patients in the practice who have had four bowel movements a month and they've gone from that over time, not a, not a month, not three months, but over the course of a year where they might now be having multiple bowel movements a day. And so you may, you know, motility activate of it will be a part of that, but that will be a late in the restoration program. It's not going to be early because you've got to be on a, you've got to be on a circadian rhythm. You really have to have a very good circadian rhythm, rhythm and bowel movement in order for that to be very effective. Okay. Um, somebody asked, could we use the elemental diet periodically, like every so many months to help with maintenance in a patient who's, whose SIBO is improving? You know, we know it. some of these patients, I, ideally we'll, we'll, we, we'd like every patient to be on a protocol for one or two months and then to resolve hundred percent, but we know a percentage of patients are gonna have lingering symptoms. It's gonna become somewhat chronic. Yes, of course. Well, of course you could do any of that, but I do want to note that I know you have such a smart group there because I've been there with you all uh, in the past and I was intimidated to do this thinking, oh, they're so smart. I, I don't even think I can, I can help them. But yes, of course you can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yes, I, it's a great idea. It's brilliant. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I, another question about motility activator. W what is the best time of day? Um, I think typically, I, I know I recommend taking it after uh, lunch and dinner. Um, yeah, I think that's best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to use this part of the protocol during active treatment with the antimicrobials and 
I'll use it earlier. Yeah, I want to get that MMC going. Mm -hmm. You know, it really gets damaged and it's a very complex system and we don't really keep very good biorhythms. You know, look at me, I'm here at 11. I feel wide awake. I probably won't sleep till two at this point tonight. But yeah, I mean, the biorhythms are really a big part of it. Um, uh, Dr. Homa Bakhtar said, is it possible to have the nights? Uh, Doc, what did you mean? Notes. Oh, the notes. Oh, okay. The oh. slides. Okay. Yeah, Would no, you... of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, Would... yes. We... They're yours. Yeah. Could you email them to me and I'll... Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Of course, use use any of them. I have permission from, you know, Alessio, whatever I've used of him or or even um Vijani. I've asked permission to use all these. So they don't care. They want they want us to teach each other. It's no problem. Right. Good. Of course. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doc. That was an awesome presentation. Well, don't intimidate me next time. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, everybody. See you all thank next Thank you, Bye. guys. Have a great evening. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.